We're going to continue on in a series that we began two weeks ago on the gospel. Uh, So you can see this idea here on the screen behind me. By the way, the purpose of this graphic is meant to demonstrate that the gospel is active, that it goes out, that it does something. And so we've been talking about the way in which the gospel is on the move in the book of Acts. And if you have your Bible, you can open them this morning to Acts chapter 3. Because in Acts chapter 3, we're going to be looking at our text this morning. We've talked about the gospel, and we have defined the gospel. It's not here on the screen for you, because this morning it's a test to see how well you've been paying attention the last two weeks. What is the gospel, Redwood Chapel? The gospel is the good news of salvation through Jesus. That's pretty good. No prompts. Good job. The gospel is the good news of salvation through Jesus. And we have talked about the way in which the gospel changes us, how it motivates us, how it does a work in us. And so we've said that this gospel has rescued us from something. But more than that, in addition to rescuing us from something, it is also doing an active work in us today. It is changing us. And so the next three weeks, we're going to be looking in the book of Acts at three different ways in which the gospel is at work. The gospel is at work to bring life over death, to bring healing to the broken, and to bring freedom to the captives. Those are the next three weeks of sermons. Life over death, healing to the broken, and freedom for the captives. So our title this morning has to do with this idea of the gospel bringing life over death. And here in the text that we will look at this morning, Jesus himself is identified as the author of life. That's an amazing title that we will spend some time looking at in just a moment. But think about that idea. What is an author but a founder or a creator or an originator? He is the source of life. And so all that we do and all that we gather around is around extolling the name of Jesus, the one who gives life to us all. If if we ever gather and we extol each other, We have missed the point. The whole purpose of gathering together as the people of God is to extol the name of Jesus, to lift high the name of Jesus, to worship the name of Jesus, because all of life comes from him. Whether we acknowledge it or not, it's true. All of life comes from him and comes to us. So, I don't want to overstate it, but I do want to make a a pretty big and bold claim here at the beginning of the message. I believe that the passage today will help us to identify the source of life, the strength for life, and the strategy for life. Those are three big claims. The source of life will be identified, the strength for life, what we need for life will be identified, and the strategy needed to live it out will also be identified in this text. So, if you come this morning and you have found life to be dull or boring or confusing or lonely or dissatisfying or miserable or empty, I pray that you will give me 30 minutes because this passage may change your mind. It may awaken in you a joy for what life is all about. And if you come here this morning already giving thanks to God and praising him for the life that he offers, then allow the next 30 minutes just to be a time of allowing your soul to be ministered to as you continue to praise him. But regardless of where you are, Either one who who wrestles with what life looks like or one who is sure of where their life is in Christ, regardless of where you are, I pray that over the next half hour together that we will see Jesus as our ultimate source, our ultimate strength, and providing the ultimate strategy for how we need to live. The reality is, friends, The reality is is that Jesus can do more for you than anything else in life. He just can. 
Now, you can be into yoga. You can be into like a strict diet. You might embrace a keto lifestyle. You may be into your essential oils or juice cleanses. You may have figured out your Enneagram number. You may be interested in winning the lottery. And all of those things could be done, but they will not do for you what Jesus can do. None of those, as good as they are, cannot do for you what Jesus can do. And so if you are interested this morning in seeing how Jesus can be your source, Jesus can be your strength and can provide the strategy for life, then I want to declare to you this morning that it starts by recognizing this, that the name of Jesus will outshine everything else because Jesus brings life to death. He brings life to death. And our world desperately needs that truth and that reality and that to take place. And so the text that we're going to look at today It comes on the heels of a miracle that's found at the beginning of Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. We're actually going to look at Acts chapter 3, 1 through 10, and Acts chapter 4 next week. And we're going to, today, pull out the, the cream of the Oreo sandwich, if you will. It's a bad analogy, but you know what I mean. There's something in the middle that we're going to look at today. Next week, we'll look at the beginning and the end. Any Oreo cookie fans in the room? We're okay? All right. You know what I mean. We're going to try to understand something that's in the middle that we need to help us uh, uh, gain this understanding. And so the beginning of the book of Acts, or excuse me, chapter 3 of Acts, tells the story of two of the apostles. Those are the called followers of Jesus Christ. Remember, there was 12 original ones. At this point, there are 12, although Judas is no longer an apostle, and now Matthias has been brought into the fold. And two of these apostles, by the name of Peter and John... Two of the, we'll say, more of the, the foremost of the apostles, um, they are on their way to the temple to pray. It's three o'clock in the afternoon. You can transport yourself to that moment if you want. If you can picture that in your mind, you're, you're in the temple in Jerusalem. It's a place of worship. It's the time of the day when many people would be coming to the temple for their worship and for their afternoon prayers. Peter and John, still living in Jerusalem after Jesus' ascension into heaven, are just doing what they have been taught to do, and they're heading to the temple to pray. There, as they come across this gate to go into the temple, chapter 3 identifies this gate as a gate that's called beautiful. The beautiful gate. Uh, Beautiful for many reasons, I'm sure. One, because the temple itself was just an incredible structure. Uh, But beautiful also because it was likely on the eastern side of the temple whereby the prophet Ezekiel and other prophecies identify that Messiah will come in and come out. Probably the same gate that Jesus entered after the triumphal entry when he comes to Jerusalem for the final time. This beautiful gate, the gate that leads into the temple, that leads into the courts, there sitting by the gate is this man who, the text says, has been paralyzed since birth. And he's asking for alms, or he's asking for handouts, and he's strategically positioned because what do pious people do when they go to worship but look for people who are in need and help to pay through alms uh, some sort of offering? And so this man, every day, was brought by his friends to receive these alms, these these offerings. And, And so as Peter and John are walking by, the man looks at them and says, Do you have any silver or gold? And Peter says to him, I don't have any silver or gold to give you, but I do have something that you may be interested in. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. Now, we're going to look at this again next week a little bit more. And so Peter reaches down, grabs the man's hand. It says that his legs and his ankles become strengthened at his grab, and he pulls him up, and all of a sudden this man is able to stand and walk. And it says not only does he stand and walk, but he goes walking and leaping and praising God in the temples. Now, That's significant for a number of reasons, one of which is that the man had never been in the temple before because he wasn't allowed to go any farther than the gate because of his infirmity. 
He wasn't allowed to go into the temple. And so the text in chapter 4, we'll look at next week, says that he's over 40 years old. Likely all of his life he has come to the temple and probably seen through the beautiful gate, but never actually able to go in. And then when he gets his strength, what does he do? He runs into that temple walking, not just walking, leaping, praising God. And as he's doing so, the people that are there in the temple, now, as he goes in through the beautiful gate into the area around what's known as Solomon's portico, it's probably mostly men who are gathered there. And, and we see that by the way that Peter addresses the crowd, but but mostly men recognize him, the guy who has just been healed, as the guy who's normally outside unable to walk. And they see him, and they're confused. In fact, the text says they are filled, verse 10, with wonder and amazement at what happened to him. Now, those two terms, wonder and amazement, have some level of strength in the English, but let me tell you, in the original language, they are packed full of meaning. To be in wonder means to be dumbstruck, to be immovable, almost like I'm frozen in this place. As I look at what just happened, I don't have the capacity to move. I'm, you ever been there? Like, I just, I got nothing to offer. I have nothing that I can say. I'm dumbstruck by what I have just seen. This idea of amazement means to be almost transported with this, this attention that all of a sudden I can't see anything else around me but just this one thing. They're in wonder and amazement. This idea of being in amazement, it only shows up three other times in the Gospels. One of the times that it shows up, it's, it's at the place where this guy by the name of Jairus, whose daughter is sick, goes to find Jesus And Jesus comes to her after she has already died. And he takes Jairus and he takes a couple of the disciples, including Peter and John, into her room. And he says, little girl, it's time to get up. And they're looking at him like, are you crazy? She's dead. And the little girl wakes up and regains her strength. And it says in that text that they looked at him with amazement, dumbstruck, I can't see anything except what I have just seen. The next time that we see this used in the Gospels, it's used of another healing of another paralytic person. You remember in Capernaum when the man who was paralyzed is brought by his friends to a house where Jesus is teaching. And the crowd is so big that they can't get into him, and so they open up a hole in the roof and they lower the man down before Jesus. And there Jesus says to him, son, your sins are forgiven. And the religious leaders are looking around going, what in the world? Who is it that's allowed to say that? That's blasphemy. In fact, they don't even say it. They just think it. And Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, says, hold on a second. Which is more difficult to say your sins are forgiven or to say to this man, get up and walk? But to show you that I have the ability to forgive his sins, I say to you, rise and walk. And this man, like the story in Acts chapter 3, he gets up walking and leaping and praising God. And the people are in rapt amazement. They can't see anything except what they have just seen. The third time it's used in the Gospels, it's used of the women who come to the tomb on the morning of Jesus' resurrection. And there they come to the tomb, and they're looking for him, and they're confused by the fact that he's not there. And an angel comes to them and tells them that he is not here, that he is risen. And it says that the women leave there in total amazement at what they have seen. This idea of amazement means that I can't see anything except for what I have just seen. And when you can't see anything except for what you have just seen, you are curious about how did it come to be, whatever I just saw. What happened just now? Because I know with my own eyes that that man was not walking five minutes ago. I know that. In fact, I've come to this temple to worship every day. I've been a good Jewish man. I've come and I've done my religious duty and I've walked by that man. In fact, I've given him alms for years. How is it that he now 
is walking. And this is the question that the people there are asking. And so in Acts chapter 3, verse 11, it says, while he, that is the healed man, clung to Peter and John, all the people around were utterly astounded. And they ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? Guys, what are you doing? Why are you looking at me, Peter says? Why are you curious as to what just happened here? As if it was something that I did. The crowd is witnessing this. They're witnessing this miracle that has taken place, but they don't know what to do with what they've seen. And so they begin to say, oh, maybe it's Peter, maybe it's John. Their inclination is to attribute the power to the apostles. And Peter's like, are you crazy? Like, don't put that on me. I, I didn't do this. We didn't do this. Why are you marveling at us? We don't have any power in ourselves. And I want you to note something in your notes or in your Bible. People who are full of the Holy Spirit, they want the attention on Jesus as soon as possible. The, 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 uh, the um, men who are here, Peter and John, they do not want the audience to be clamoring for them. They want to direct the attention to Jesus as soon as possible. Don't put this on us. This was not our doing. In fact, Peter's going to stand up and tell them exactly who Jesus is. You'll remember last week, the last time that Peter opened his mouth to a crowd following Pentecost, about 3,000 people became followers of Jesus. Here at the end of this message, it says in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, that another 2,000 souls will be added to their number. Over the course of these two messages from Peter, the audience is so curious about what is happening in their city that they're coming to Jesus in droves. They're coming to him. They want to know. Again, our familiarity with Jesus, our familiarity with church, our familiarity with religion, for those of us that have been around it for a long time, leaves us oftentimes missing the wonder of who Jesus is and what Jesus is really all about. But for those in the audience who for the very first time are recognizing, I was here a couple of weeks ago when this man's trial took place and his crucifixion happened, and I know the story of the fact that his tomb is now empty, and I heard about what happened at Pentecost just a few days later, and now I'm seeing this man get up and walk. There's something about this Jesus, and they have complete focus and complete attention on who Jesus is. If you can, church, see him for the first time this morning. See him as the one who has the power to change death into life. So here's Peter's message. He's gonna point us to the identity, the power, and the presence of Jesus. Peter's message that we're going to look at here in this text is going to point us to the identity and the power and the presence of Jesus. Let's start with the identity. The way that Peter identifies Jesus is that Jesus is the source of life. Jesus is the source of life. Look at verses 13 through 15 with me. It's here on the text, on the screen. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. Now, just stop there for a second. Peter wants to identify who Jesus is, but he's also going to remind the religious people of their contribution to this current situation. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers glorified his servant Jesus. He's going to get to Jesus really quickly. Glorified his servant Jesus. But remember, 
You delivered him over and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he decided to release him. You denied, he goes on to say, the holy and the righteous one. And you asked for a murderer to be granted to you. That's in reference to Barabbas, the insurrectionist who the crowd calls for at Jesus' trial for him to be released. You asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And in doing so, you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead, and to this we are all witnesses. He, he is inviting the audience, thousands strong, who have just witnessed this miracle, to come to grips with the fact that this Jesus comes from God. He is the righteous one. He is holy. He is the author of life. But you played a part in his death. In fact, you delivered him to Pilate. You denied the holy and righteous one. You asked for a murderer to be released. You call, killed the author of life. This horrible, horrible decision that Peter is reminding the religious men of in Jerusalem. They're reminding him what they have done. In some ways, Peter has brought a new trial to the situation. In other words, the religious leaders are now on trial as Peter is given opportunity to declare boldly, very boldly, this is what you have done. You were given a choice and you did not choose well. Religious leaders, do you want Barabbas or do you want Jesus? You chose Barabbas. Do you want the deliverer or do you want a murderer? You chose a murderer. Do you want life or do you want death? And you requested death. Do you want forgiveness or do you want your sin? You chose your sin. Do you want reconciliation or are you going to do this your own way? And religious leaders, you chose to do this your own way. And in doing so, you have killed the author of life. Now, we can read into this with our 21st century, been a Christian for numbers of years, self-righteousness, and go, oh, those dumb religious leaders, how could they be so stupid? Didn't they recognize what they had right in front of him? How could they choose to bind up Jesus when what he is offering them is freedom? But if we're honest, we have to recognize that that decision is indicative of what we do every time we sin. Every time we sin, we are turning our back on the freedom that Jesus offers in place of the path that we think makes sense to us. And so we bind up the way of Jesus in order to choose the way of self. We bind up loving our neighbor and we choose self-centeredness. We bind up self-control and we choose addiction or drunkenness. We bind up the image of God or we choose pornography. We bind up gentleness and we choose anger. When we sin, we bind up that which Jesus came to release us from. And so before we get too self-righteous to these religious leaders and condemn them, let us first recognize that while this was a very horrible decision, it's a decision that you and I have made in our lives as well. We have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God, and chosen death over life. But here's what the gospel does. The gospel comes into a situation where death has been chosen and it reverses the equation. Instead of the death that you have chosen, now Jesus comes, the good news of salvation through Jesus comes and offers life in the midst of the death. This is the gift that God offers us. He is the author of life, the prince of life the pioneer of life, the one at the forefront of life. And, and the rest of the scriptures testify to this. They help us to see the way in which Jesus is the author of life. Consider Colossians. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, it says, He, that is Jesus, is the firstborn of all creation. 
All things were created through him and for him. He's the author of life. John chapter 1 tells us that all things were made through him. That is Jesus. In fact, in him was life, and that life was the light of men. Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, that in these last days, he, that is God, has spoken to us by his son, that is Jesus, who he appointed to be the heir of all things. It goes on to say, through him, he also created the world. He's the radiance of the glory of God, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making, it goes on to say in this passage, after making purification for sins, what does Jesus do? He sits down at the right hand of majesty on high. Peter wants the audience to see, I believe that the Holy Spirit wants us to see, that oftentimes we choose death over life, but through Jesus, the source and the author of life, the gospel allows you to live with life over death. Amen? That is a good truth. That is a life-giving truth. That should free you when you are battling with your own temptations and your own struggles to recognize that Jesus came to free you from those things, and it's the world's desire to keep you bound in those things. Do not mistake what Jesus has done for you. He's the author of life. So our identity here is that Jesus is the source of life. We want to see Jesus as the source of life. But then the power that we want to understand is that Jesus gives us the strength for life. Not only is he the source of life, but he gives us the strength for life. Look at verse 16, 17, and 18. It says this, in his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong who you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given this man this perfect health in the presence of you all. And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers, but what God foretold by the mouth of the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he has now fulfilled. Now, I want you to understand, Peter's saying, The reason why this man is now walking is not because of anything that I have done, but through the name of Jesus, period, end of story. It's the name of Jesus that has given this man his new life. Now, I know what you did. You did in ignorance. He's going to give him a strategy for dealing with that ignorance in just a second. I know what you did. You did in ignorance, but all of this was to fulfill exactly what God said about his Messiah, but know this, the reason why that man is walking is because of the name of Jesus. The power is that Jesus is the strength for life. Don't you love the names of Jesus? Do you ever take time to think about them, to recall in your mind the many wonderful names of Jesus? I've put some on the screen. He is Jesus. He is Messiah. He's the Savior of the world. He's our Redeemer. He's our Lord. He's the Son of the living God, the Righteous One. He is the Holy One of Israel. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. He is Emmanuel, that is God with us. He is our great high priest who goes before us into the throne room of God making intercession for us. He is the Good Shepherd. He is the chief cornerstone, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the image of the invisible God, the rock, the living water, the bread of life. Jesus is a powerful name. Jesus Messiah, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord, Emmanuel, Don't you love those choruses that just sing the name of Jesus? Our identity is that Jesus is the source of life. The power is that Jesus is the strength for life. And his presence gives us the strategy that is needed 
to live this life. Look at verses 19, 20, and 21. Repent, therefore, and turn back, that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ that is appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until the time for restoring all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. The strategy... It's actually pretty simple. The strategy involves two people, two parties, you and God. And the first part of the strategy is simply repent and turn back. That's what it says there in the text. To repent, as we said last week, has this idea of allowing your mind to be changed from the way that it's currently thinking. I'm thinking about life this direction. Repenting means I'm beginning to think about life in a different direction. Turning back has a physical activity that's attached to it. I was going in this direction. I, re- I return away and I now go in this direction. These two words working together are talking about a complete metamorphosis of the way that we approach life. We think differently and we walk differently. That is our part in the strategy. Repent and turn away. Change your thinking, change your direction. Now, the Holy Spirit is involved in that process for sure, but he invites us to recognize the lordship of Jesus so that we might have the ability to repent and turn back. And then Jesus plays his role. It says when you do this, when you repent and you turn back, that your sins will be blotted out. That's, a, that's an amazing theological truth. It doesn't just mean that your sins will be covered. It means that your sins will be erased. Did you hear what I said? Not just that your sins are covered, that they're still there. They just they don't stink as bad as they used to but they're gone. They're erased. They're blotted out. They're wiped away. The word blotted out, it has this idea of being anointed and washed in every corner that they are no longer present, obliterated, erased, done away with. That's Jesus' part. He makes you clean. And then it says, in his doing so, times of refreshing will come. You ever needed a time of refreshing? I mean, we we go to the spa for a reason. We play golf for a reason. Some of you get manicures and pedicures for a reason. Because you, you need a time of refreshing. You need a time to to be taken care of. And that's, that's okay. But the time of refreshing that's being talked about here is far better than a mani-pedi, let me tell you. It's far better than a massage. We're talking about Jesus forever dealing with the problem of sin in this world. It happens in moments while we await his coming, but it happens for eternity when he comes again. And so maybe you come to church on a Sunday morning looking for a time of refreshing, and maybe you receive that. You walk out of here able to breathe a little bit deeper, able to worship a little bit more freely, able to connect with people who you love and you know, that you know love you. And that's a, it's a time of refreshing for you. Praise God for that. That's one of the gifts that God gives us. But, but his eternal gift is that a time of refreshing when sin is forever done away with, when there's no more tears, no more sickness, no more disease, And all that is left is eternal fellowship with a Father who loves us far greater than we can ever understand this side of heaven. There's an anticipation of Christ's coming. And there's a day that we're looking forward to when all things will be restored. This is what God promises. That the brokenness of this world will be fixed that the pain of this world will go away, 
that the traps that you find yourself in on a daily basis, you'll be broken free from forever, blotted out, gone. You repent and allow Jesus to do the work. Notice it doesn't say you got to repent and then you've got to deal with your sin. It says you repent and allow him to deal with your sin. It's an important distinction. Yes, there is effort, but it's ultimately done through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And so the invitation to us this morning is to trust him for that salvation, to trust that he is the author of life, to trust that he has the ability to take us from a state of being dead, separated by our sin, and to move us to make a transaction through the work of his son Jesus that moves us from a state of death to a state of life. This is what the gospel does. This is the good news of salvation through Jesus. No longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Heavenly Father, as we come to this table, a table of the Lord's Supper, a table of a meal where we consume these elements of bread and wine. We do so because your son commanded us to, to do this as often as we meet in remembrance of what Jesus has done. And Paul says, not only are we remembering what Jesus has done, but we're also proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes back. And so in response to what we have just seen from your word, Father, Would you receive from us our time of remembrance and our time of proclamation that you have invited us to? Will you allow us to commune with one another, to fellowship with one another around this meal? What a gift that you have offered us. And we praise you. There's been a few things that have been mentioned this morning that I would invite you to as next steps. Firstly, if you have thought through and considered these claims of Jesus and what it looks like to consider him as the source of your life, as the strength of your life, that you need a strategy for your life, I want to invite you to come find one of the pastors or leaders here at our church. We can pray with you right now encourage you in your walk with Jesus, even as it just begins, even if it's beginning this morning. What a great gift that is. Secondly, we have a new members orientation, as Mike said, that's coming up in a couple of weeks. Please register for that using the Church Center app so that we can know of your interest for that. And men, our men's fraternity beginning on October the 9th, I invite you to come and be a part of that, a great opportunity to meet other men. All of that can be done through the Church Center app or with an, inf- with, uh, an email to our church office, and we'll take care of you and get you situated. The reason there's a $15 cost is because there's materials that are provided um, with that cost, and so that just recoups the cost that we need. I'm going to leave you with a benediction this morning uh, from the words of Paul from Romans chapter 8. Paul says, for I am convinced, but I want to say together that we are convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things that are present, nor things to come, nor power, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God bless you. Have a great day.